welcome. Thank you. Um, Sheila Linton is actually here. She's that little box sitting in front of you. Um, <laughs> so um, you can put her in. Okay, okay you got her. Um, welcome. We still don't have, um, and if you wouldn't mind, I know that the introductions sometimes get a little annoying, but if you really wouldn't mind going and doing it again, I'm really trying to memorize everyone's name. And I would really be grateful if we could do that, just go around the table and do it very quickly and be fun. So, Chief, do you want to start since you're off? Sure. I'm uh, Don Stevens, Chief of the Mill Beacon out of the Trust. Ken Schatz, Commissioner of the Department for Children and Families. Rebecca Hunter, Defender General's Office. Karen Richards, Human Rights Commission. I'm Jessica Brown. Sheila's not here, so I'm going to say yes. that I, my preferred pronouns are she and her. Um, and I am the managing attorney of the Public Defender Office in Chittenden County. Brian Grierson, Chief Superior to James Pepper, designee for Department of State Attorneys and Chairs. Eitan Nasrat, Longo Chair, he, him. Uh, Julio Thompson, Director of Civil Rights of uh, Vermont Attorney General's Office. Ruben Jennings, President of Rights. Uh, Nancy Waples, Vermont Superior Court Judge. I'm Ingrid Jonas with Vermont State Police and um, the designee for Commissioner Anderson for Public Safety. Lisa Menard, Commissioner of Corrections. Great. Um, and all the rest of you. <laughs> uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Sheila. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Oh, did you have something else? Sheila? That was it. Okay. Sheila, Got it, thank you. I'm with the County People Power ACMP. I'm Jesse Rowaza, I'm the Vice President of the Wyndham County NWCP. Gary Scott, the State Police. Monica Weaver with the Department of Corrections. Brenda Churchill with the LGBTQIA Alliance of Vermont. Um, Chloe White, Policy Director of Vermont. Great. Okay. Um, pardon? It's just feedback. Yeah. Okay, it's just feedback. I'm going to be a little. It's great. Um, I want to, let's start with the approval of the minutes, which David sent to all of us. Um, there were two sets of minutes, one from um, the 14th of November of 2017, um, and then the other from our last meeting, which was June 7th, uh, June 12th. So let's start with, um, the minutes from November 14th. Maybe ask Sheila to get the phone on, on mute. I'm mute. I think she might be getting feedback from me. Ask her that. Sheila, is your phone on mute? It is now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, David also mentioned um, that if you had. Uh, in his email, he mentioned if you had amendments or changes to forward them to him, he didn't say anybody had to me. So I'm guessing. Make a motion to approve the minutes. Would you like to? Would anyone like to second that one? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All abstentions. I mean, it's I mean, it's yeah. Okay, but it carries. Thank you. Okay, those are approved. June twelfth. Okay, you're all looking at me like you looked that one over too. Mm -hmm. We need a motion. Or motion not. To approve okay. Last month's minutes. There's a motion to approve last month's minutes. Is it seconded? Second. It's been seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? All abstentions? Okay. Three abstentions. All right. 
It carries as well. There will be, there's a discussion, as you'll see on the agenda later on, about, um, about minutes, about the secretary's position and so on. Here, I managed to forget to do this because I'm so rattled because I'm on the phone. Uh, <laughs> you will know, I managed, I, I really just sort of screw up and I wanted to put that in the announcement. There's nowhere here where I wrote in like way forward. Where do we do, what do we do next for the next meeting? I managed to blow that, people. I don't know why, I just did. So I'm gonna stick that in after the discussion of the secretary's position and the quality of minutes and before the scheduling of the next meeting. We're gonna talk about what we're gonna do next. That was very productive last time, I thought. And particularly since today, Karen Richards, the executive director of the Human Rights Commission, is here. And um, we were very clear about wanting that to happen. So I think that the discussion will, in fact, give us some direction as we go forward. Um, are there other announcements? No? OK. Um, I could be very formal. I, I took your, your bio off of the Please. website, and I figured you really would rather that I not do that. I would. Because I think you know everyone in the room except me. So um, anyway, um, just to refresh our recollection, there was some discussion about, actually there was a lot of discussion, about starting with 6A of the statute, which is on page 4, if you have it. Um, and I will read that if it's, it concerns how to institute a public complaint process to address perceived implicit bias across all systems of state government. There was discussion last time about having Karen Richards come in and talk about complaint process, processes. Um, and we were hoping, I guess, that you could do that. Perhaps we could start the discussion off with talking about oh, pros and cons of the system as it exists presently for your commission, um, suggestions you might have for improvements in that that we might benefit from. Um, so I guess I'll stop talking now and give it to you. Okay. Um, do you want to give me the phone for um, Karen? Not at all. Hold on. Hi, Sheila on the phone. <laughs> Hi, Karen. So um, the HRC has jurisdiction to investigate complaints of discrimination in um, state government employment, um, public accommodations, and housing. And that process is basically um, triggered by someone calling our office or emailing us or in some other way getting in contact with us and then providing us with the information necessary to make a determination of whether their um, case presents what we call a prima facie case of discrimination. And if it presents such a case, then we can take a complaint. We're not obligated to take a complaint in every single case. We have discretion to take or not take a complaint. Um, we try to take all the complaints that come our way that say the prima facie case, but sometimes resources are an issue. Um, so basically, once that happens, a complaint is drafted up, sent to the complainant. They sign it um, in front of a notary, send it back. And then it gets sent out to the respondent. The respondent has a time period to respond. And then it's assigned to an investigator, and an investigation starts. And that investigation includes um, looking at it in all documents that need to be looked at, looking, um, interviewing any witnesses that need to be interviewed, and then trying to settle the case as it goes along, if that's possible. If it's not, then a report, investigative report gets written up, which summarizes the facts and does a legal analysis of that. That gets presented to our commissioners, who then um, read that and any responses. The parties come in and can make a brief argument to the commission about their position with regard to whatever the recommendation from the investigator is, which is grounds to find discrimination or not. Um, and then they vote up or down on the recommendation of the investigator. And then from there, if it's a no reasonable grounds finding, it's dismissed 
and it goes away. If there's a reasonable grounds finding, it comes to me in what we call the post um, period, where I will then spend another six months, which is my statute of limitations for filing in court, um, to try to resolve the matter between the parties. If it can't be resolved, then the commissioners will authorize me or not to file the matter in court, um, and then we go forward in a court proceeding from there to the traditional. And there's, it, that's a de novo here, so it's all, um, there's no record in which the, the court is off. Okay. So that's the current process. Um, Does it work? Um, Do you like it? <laughs> <laughs> Are there problems? Um, there's always problems. Okay. Um, but I, I think generally it works pretty well. Um, we are able to settle the vast majority of the cases either usually as we go through the process and we start to get a sense of um, where the case is going, it's lean, evidence is leaning this way or that way, we can then give the parties a heads up and it doesn't look like they're going to be able to prove this or it looks like responding, you may have some problems here and perhaps you want to discuss how you might want to make this go away. Um, and so we will do that. We, if we enter into a settlement agreement and the HRC is part of it, which we always are, unless the parties go to an outside mediator and, and do it through there, um, if we're a party to the action, then we will, we can enforce the agreement in court, and we can also, um, we, if we put in deliverables in there for the public interest, like changing policies or getting training or all those things, we track those and make sure that they get done. Um, so I think it's a pretty effective process. Um, it, I think the, the downsides to it are it takes a long time because I have three investigators and they are carrying a caseload of anywhere from 12 to 16 cases at a time. Um, and some of these investigations, as Lisa knows, are massive. <laughs> I mean, really tens of thousands of pages of documents sometimes and, you know, multiple, multiple witnesses being interviewed. And so they can drag on for a long time, and I don't, which is why we try to settle them, because for many parties that is not the best thing, right, is to have this thing dragging on for sometimes up to a year and sometimes a little bit longer. So I would say that's one of the problems is the process doesn't move as quickly as we might like it to. Mm -hmm. um, Karen, can I ask you yeah. a question about sure. the clarifying? So the six-month time frame yeah. to allow for the out-of-court informal process to work, yeah. how does that compare to the one year you were just talking about, the one year on average time frame it takes to work on the Oh, so that, that's just from the time that there's a finding by the commissioner. So there's six months after that finding to try to work out that settlement before okay. we file in court. Okay. Um, and that, that statute of limitations can be extended by agreement of the parties. So if we are in the middle of a negotiation and we're not quite done, the parties will usually stick to more time so that we have an opportunity to try to um, continue to work out the settlement. Um, let's see, so other things that don't work as well as they could. Um, one of the things that's always troubled me is that the, the statute requires that a complaint be submitted under oath, um, but it doesn't require that the respondent respond under oath. <laughs> so it's as if we, we make an assumption that somehow the complainant is always might be lying when they bring a case forward unless we make them swear under oath that they're telling the truth, whereas the respondent can say whatever they want and we don't really care whether they're under oath or not, which has always been a little disturbing to me. It seems like both parties should be either under oath or neither. And sometimes that um, notarization of the complaint is actually very problematic for people who don't have access to um, a vehicle or, you know, can't find a notary or can't afford to pay a notary. Um, so there are some barriers associated with that as well that I think um, are not necessarily helpful sometimes. Okay. Um, and then I think um, the other thing is just trying to um, move the process along which we've gotten a lot better at so that the complainant um, can see the result of the complaint coming within a fairly short time after calling so that they're getting the complaint in the mail and they can follow through because we used to not have that as tight as it is now and then we 
people would drop off because by the time you got the complaint to them, they lost interest, you know, or had moved on to other problems in their lives. And so, um, you know, it's been important to really get those complaints out as quickly as we can. Mm -hmm. So those are just some things that jump out at me. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to answer any questions. I have a question. Just curious in terms of the process. Do you accept all complaints and investigate everyone? Do you refer any to other places? Or how does that system work? Um, so we um, take almost all the complaints in as long as it states a prima facie case and as long as we have the resources to do it. The ones that we may turn down are ones that really are really marginal about whether there's a prima facie case there. Okay. Um, we might turn that case down just, or if it's a, if it's a marg marginal sounding case and it's going to be really complicated, we might turn it down because we don't have the resources to do it. Um, but short of that, um, you know, we, we try to take in any complaint that's jurisdictional. Um, we do refer any private employment cases to Julio's office because that's where those get done. Um, if we don't take an employment case from a state employee because we don't think it might meets the prima facie case, we also refer them to the EEOC so that they can file with the EEOC. Mm -hmm. um, and then people can also, if we turn them down in a housing case, they can go to HUD. And then if HUD takes it, HUD sends it back to us. <laughs> so sometimes we turn down cases that we think are really marginal, and HUD takes them and then sends them back, and we end up investigating them. <laughs> anyway, so you know, that, that's just the way it works. Yeah, maybe I missed it. Um, who determines whether or not they're marginal? And it's, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the executive. And, and you'll take referrals from other agencies oh, yeah. like disability rights? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we get a lot of referrals from the community. And Karen, I might have misheard you. Did yep. you say there's actually a small category of cases, not the marginal ones, but the ones that are, are meet the prima facie standard but are so complicated that your commission can't take it? Did you say that? Yes. And where do they go? Um, they don't fall within. We would the refer them employment. generally to private counsel. Mm -hmm. Private counsel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or legal aid, if it's something legal aid does. But those cases, I can't even think of one that I've turned down on that basis. Okay. It's more, it's more that they're marginal, and you know, there it, it may be um, somebody with a mental health issues, for for example, where you're not really sure um, if what they're telling you is reality or not reality, and there's indications that it's not um, reality. Um, Maybe because we've had experience <laughs> before, or and in those cases, though, or the ones that you send to other places, do you keep track? Do you follow up to find out what happened yeah. to those? Okay. I. Okay. Um, I'm curious. Is there? I know what preemptation is. I would imagine a lot of the people who bring complaints don't. Is there some? interface within, within the commission that it sort of explains to people what exactly is going on. They need to tell us. So um, we have questionnaire, complaint questionnaires online, and those basically seek the information that we need to figure out whether there's a prima facie case there. If they send that questionnaire back in and the information is incomplete or unclear, then um, Jocelyn, our executive staff assistant, calls them or contacts them by email and says, I need you to tell me the following information. And usually where most people um, either don't get that they need to be in protected status somehow, so they call and just say, I'm being discriminated against, but they don't understand that it has to be based on protected status, so that's pretty easy. Um, and then the hardest part is figuring out the because of, right? So what evidence do you have that this is because of your disability or because of your race or because of your sex, right? And that's the part, because most people are much more sophisticated about the way that they discriminate these days. They don't outright come out and say things. And so um, you have to kind of sift around and try to find out um, what led you to believe that this was based on your status. And, and then if we get enough, we can pull enough out of there, then we'll take a complaint and we'll investigate and find out what's there. Can I just elaborate on that a little bit? Karen, is there a, I just elaborate just for the folks who aren't involved in this. So in the Vermont Attorney General's Office, we do a very similar thing. We have to 
Prima facie case, prima facie means at first blush. It means if everything you told me is true, there's a violation of the law. Uh, that's part of the reason why some jurisdictions require people to sign something under oath. So if uh, someone we're investigating says, we're not going to answer your letters, we can go to a judge and say, we already have a sworn statement. And they haven't disputed these things. And these things that happened, if they're true, violates the law. So that's what prima facie case is. In Karen's shop and in our shop, um, the work to find out whether you fit the prima facie element, that's really our job, right? We're lawyers, all your investigators are lawyers, and they're very good. But what basically we do at the intake level in your questionnaire is the same way, and we refer cases to her when they don't, they don't fall under our laws, is basically ask somebody, what happened to you? Usually people have a story, they say, I, I, and they will, whether they realize it or not, they will describe a right to something they have. I have a right to a job because I'm qualified, or I have a right to housing, or I have the right to go into a grocery store. Something bad happened to me. And the reason that the, 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 the bad thing happened to me is because something the law prohibits that we enforce. So I was not, I was asked for additional identification at Home Depot because the person said I had an accent, right? And I didn't provide the identification, they denied me service. They don't know anything about prima facie case. They just tell us what happened. And so it's a very, it can be a very interactive process where someone says, yeah, this happened to me. Why do you think it happened? And sometimes the why story is not within the laws we prohibit. So I remember years ago, heartbreaking telephone call about someone who's being harassed at work because she's overweight. And our laws don't prohibit discrimination on the basis of weight. So we have to walk that person through the story to find out whether the person is so heavy that she might qualify as disabled or regarded as disabled or something. But we never really use the word prima facie case with her. It's just like, why do you think this happened? And we elicit that story. So Karen said, we kind of pull that out of them. I just want to explain how that actually works because most people don't understand this. I, I encounter lots of lawyers who don't understand it. Um, so, and um, we get cases all the time and sometimes they come to us maybe as a hate crime and law enforcement doesn't think it's a crime. Maybe we look at it, we don't think it's a crime, but it might still violate one of the laws that Karen, um, that Karen enforces or the Human Rights Commission enforces. And so we'll refer it over to them and then let them tell their story to Karen and then she's trying to figure out, so if what you're telling me is true, does that violate a law that we enforce? And sometimes it doesn't. Or um, we had some gentlemen complaint was that of stuff that happened over 15 years ago. The statute of limitations is six years yes. max. Right. So mm -hmm. we have nowhere to go with that. We try to explain, if I went to court, a nice judge, a couple of judges in Rome, <laughs> are going to ask me, why, are, why am I listening to your case? How, are, how do you get past the statute? And so we have to explain it to them. And so I just want to, even though there are questionnaires and that sounds really impersonal, our experience, and we refer people to Karen all the time, and then they call us back and say, thank you. Um, we try to make that very, very user-friendly, because we just say, what happened? What happened next? Who was there? When did it happen? And then, you know, they do all the work on the Yeah, and my assistant will spend sometimes an hour on the phone with somebody, and it's very clear, as I'm listening to the conversation, that it's not going anywhere in terms of jurisdictional, but she will take the time to listen to their story and to try to get them someplace else that they can go. So um, she spends a lot of time. And then when you have a case, you always listen, because as the story develops, the person thinks it's because of this, and it's because mm -hmm. of something else illegal. So we had a case few years ago where someone um, was hard of hearing. Um, she had a hearing aid, she didn't view herself as disabled. To us, it sounded very much like a disability case. And she thought it was her age, um, right? Because she, she, yeah. she can get around, she has a hearing aid, she can do what she needs to do. But the evidence really pointed that way, so we amended our original investigation to go where the evidence Yeah, went. and that's and what we do too. It's very, it's, so we'll, it's we'll add retaliation sometimes. Sometimes we'll add sex when they think it's age or add age when they think it's sex or whatever it is. And our, uh, the other thing, I'll get, <laughs> um, the other thing is that complaints have to be filed with us within a year of the last act of discrimination. So we only have that one year window to look back. I guess the question I have is also for yourself, but also the Attorney General's office is, do you guys keep statistics on where the complaints are coming from um, and
and then what kind of roadblocks might be thrown up. The reason why I'm saying is because if one of our purposes of what we're trying to do is, is have a unified complaint area, we kind of need to focus on problem areas. Like say for instance, say you have, not to pick on corrections, Go but, ahead. but say, say you have inmates that are spending all day making complaints because they're not being treated well, they're not being able to have the religious practices or whatever it may be, it could overwhelm and flood your office, but I'm just saying, is there, is there a way to break down those so you know where to where people, whether it be in the new position that's being uh, created or whether it be this area where we're saying we need a centralized complaint system, how do you focus on putting the resources to the proper places and also seeing how to mitigate some of the uh, where the problem areas may be, right? So we do have a question on the questionnaire, or on our, we have a data log that we keep all the calls in, and what happened, and who called them, and what they called about. Um, in that, we have a space to ask, how, how did you get to us? Who, who told you to call us? Um, I noticed as I was filling some things in the log that it's not actually being filled in all that often, so it's not that helpful. So I need to talk to Jocelyn about that when she gets back from vacation. But sometimes it's just hard to get that in when somebody's trying to tell you a story. Well, how did you, why'd you call us in the first place? And it sounds a little rude. So anyway, um, the, so anyway, we do that and we also track where people are calling from. So what town, city, whatever. So we have that data. Um, but in terms of micro level below that. It's know, more in terms of since we're working from the state end of things, right? I mean, because you hold, you control the state complaints as well, right? Yeah. You said, so, I mean, the state police have done an awesome job being able to identify where there are problem areas so you know where to focus. If we get to the micro level, like saying, all of a sudden you see 50% of your complaints coming from inmates that are in corrections, mm -hmm. then you might be able to put something in place to mitigate that or try to, to, to to work that. And I'm only talking about within the state because that's what we're concentrating on from our from our level is how do we create a unified area within the state? Like what department's being complained against? Like is it the HR that's being complained against? Is it the Department of Transportation? Is it okay. so I can adjust that, that a little bit list on our end just for comparison. So whenever we Whenever we have enough information that we think we're going to at least send out a questionnaire, so like it's possible it's a violation. If they send in the questionnaire, that gets logged into our system. We log the complainant's name. We log the employer's name, because a lot of these cases are employment cases. If they identify, let's say it's a perpetrator, harasser, decision maker, we log them in as an involved party. And, if, and when the case is then the files then turn over to an investigator, the paralegal who does the intake, who creates the file, identifies, let's say it's Acme Rocket Company, right? So let's use a Bugs Bunny example. Uh, Acme Rocket Company is the complainant. So the investigator, when they get the file, well now the file numbers and the dates, the last five complaints we've had against, or any, against Acme Rocket. And let's say there's a vice president of Acme Rocket named Johnny Masher. But also, if he's named as an involved party, He'll show up on our list. Have we ever had him? Yeah, he used to work at, you know, Whammo Rocket Company two years ago and was filed for sexual harassment. Now he's at a new job and there's a new sexual harassment. So that investigator will pull the Whammo file and, and maybe talk to another investigator who interviewed Johnny Masher. Um, and we also have complainants who filed a million complaints. So some, we have one, we have one fellow uh, who. He applies for jobs, he doesn't get the jobs, and then he complains. We have many, many complaints. Um, and then we didn't find enough evidence. And then he went to the EEOC Boston office and haunted them for a while. Um, uh, but you know, every case we try to take that we still run them down because people who are eccentric or maybe imagining uh, slights can still be the victims, right? Pickpockets can get stabbed or robbed. Um, so, um, and that guy ultimately, when the ban the box law was, was passed, he was applying for jobs and he would come and report to us employers who weren't complying with the laws. So now he's actually, this guy's actually doing more work in the field than our investigators do. Um, because he keeps up, 
applying for jobs and sending us the job application. And then we find them out. And we send a light letter usually to employers who they haven't caught up to speed with the law. Yes, but we do, we do keep those cases, but we're not going to just say, we're not going to take someone serious because it's their third complaint. Because some people, like people who are disabled, for example, might be the victims of serial discrimination. That could happen. I guess I'm trying to narrow, maybe I better narrow down the definition. What I'm, what I'm trying to discern is, is there a way within your systems currently that you could check a box saying, this is a complaint against a state entity or something else? Because part of what we're focusing on is complaints against the state agencies. So if you could break that down saying, like I said, I don't care who made the complaint, it's just like, is the Depart human, Department of Human Resources, do they have a complaint? Right. Why? And Or does the Attorney Gen General's office have a complaint against it? Why? I, not that I don't care about Joe Schmo or Acme Company or some, some but I'm saying is. Well, we don't investigate the state because we're lawyers for the state. Right, no, no, I understand that conflict. Right, right, no, no, comparison of how our data But you know where I'm yeah, going? Yes, and so we do have that information. We can tell you how many cases were brought against the Department of Corrections okay. and whether they were public accommodations cases or employment cases. Um, we could tell you that about AOT. We could tell you that about any agency of state government. We don't get a lot of this is good, like a lot of complaints by state employees of discrimination. Um, so we, on average, six to eight a year, sometimes up to 11, 12, 13, but not, I think that. 11 of what? Um, complaints of discri employment discrimination. Employment discrimination. Yeah. Meaning so somebody right. works for the state. Somebody who works for the state against right. the state. Right. 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 But, right. but I'm trying to expand it, I guess. I'm trying to get to the meat. Like, say there's a lot of people that are individuals complain about Vermont State Police, are profiling, they're, they're not treating me well, they're not employing me. That could be Joe Schmo from Kokomo, but it's a, it's a, it's a state agency that's being complained against. I'm not so much saying just employees that work for the state complaining about the state. I'm talking about anybody complaining about, complaining about a state agency and how that breaks down right. so we know where the problem areas are. Right. I guess that's... Right. So those complaints that are not about employment that are against a state agency would be a public accommodations case. In other words, a state is a place that provides good services to the general public that makes them a place of public accommodation. So anytime they discriminate against uh, somebody who's receiving services from them or somebody who just tries to come in off the street in a wheelchair and can't get in, like all of those come to our office and would be against whatever state agency um, would be involved. Including the, police cases. In, 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 roads including police cases, yes. And so Karen, when can you, you get, do you track that down to the officer level, the detective level, or? Um, we don't track it in the database down to that level, but we certainly, you know, know which officers are involved because of the investigation and who the witnesses are. So, so just to follow up, so since we're dealing with criminal and juvenile justice and we're looking at racial disparities and also a place to send all complaints, you have that mechanism in place. You can identify those complaints and could keep statistical data on that if you have the proper resources available. Yes. Okay. What we can't do is tell you that Joe Schmo called and made this complaint against the state police and give you any factual information because we that's all confidential up until no, the saying. point that it gets to a reasonable ground. Right. We're looking for a vessel to send mm -hmm. complaints to and that's why we're kind of going down this road. That's why I'm trying to narrow the focus a little. Um, when it, because we're trying to make a recommendation on the A, which is how to institute a public complaint process to address perceived implicit bias across all systems of state government. And we're, we're saying we think there's something in place, and how do we capitalize on that if there is? Yeah. And if there's breakdowns, how do we fix that? And part of what we have to do to make it work for you. Is that? Yeah. You've been waiting. Uh, Back to your, when you add intake, uh, how do you deal with a complaint that on its face there's a concurrent court proceeding, whether it's a criminal court proceeding or a case in family court, or maybe pre-family court, but DCF is clearly involved in a family? How do you deal with those cases? 
So the statute says, and I'm going to quote it, but um, it's, it basically says that if there is a complaint, I don't know if it's statute or rule, actually, but statute or rule says if, it's fi if there's a complaint filed with another entity, we generally will not take it. The exception to that is housing cases, because HUD requires us to take them up to the point that the trial begins. <laughs> so we have to continue to investigate up until a trial begins in the matter in a housing case. But other than that, if somebody says, I already filed an administrative complaint at the Human Services Board about this, for example, we would not take a complaint on that because they're already in another form. And when you say complaint, a criminal complaint in criminal court would not trigger that meaning? Um, I'm trying to think how a criminal complaint. Uh, a prosecutor would. files an information, a charging document, a right. complaint. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean that you are barred from accepting Co a similar complaint from the Correct. criminal defendant. Correct. You, you could still accept yes. that. Yes. Okay. It's whether it's in an, an adjudicatory body of some sort. I'm not following. I have to. I'm not quite following. All right. So I guess, Michael, let me give this to you a specific. Yeah. Uh, I'm from the Defender General's office. We are assigned to represent um, Jane Doe at time of arraignment. Now, she's only there and has been assigned because there's been a criminal complaint that prosecutors have initial, initiated proceedings against our client. That same client, Jane, alleges that the police officer who stopped her, right, um, stopped her only because she was driving while black. Mm -hmm. So she has a complaint. Yep. She files that with you. Yep. Um, but because of that stop, the, the detention results in some evidence that is the basis for the prosecution. So it's the same subject matter. Right. Um, How do you deal with that? Yeah, so it, it, yeah, generally if, so this comes up in labor board cases where somebody's um, filed a labor board complaint and if they are um, litigating at the labor board a claim of discrimination, we will not take it because they're litigating that somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So if your defendant was um, raising racial profiling as a defense in the criminal case or raising it somehow in the criminal case, we might not take it because somebody else is in that situation. But if she's just if she thinks it was an unlawful stop that violates our statute and she called, we would not, just because there's a criminal case pending, would not refuse to take it. So if the defense attorney at the suppression motion alleged that the evidence obtained in the unlawful traffic stop was because of implicit bias by the police officer, right. that there was no legitimate ground to stop but for the racism, right. that would be enough to stop the complaint process? Um, no, no, well, because we're a civil process, right? right? And that's a criminal process. So that person may still have rights under civil law to redress their discrimination. So we could still look at Concurrently. that. Concurrently. Right, yeah. You don't put it on hold as a practice in the civil, um, mm -hmm. the civil proceeding? No, not, not as a general. Huh. Do you connect with a defense attorney as a general? We try to. Okay. With, I mean, the investigator. Is a representative? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Karen, do you give any idea about how much of your caseload is um, complaints of racial discrimination in either law enforcement or in the criminal justice system in general? Um, not a high percentage. Um, I would say. We get, on average, maybe one complaint of racial profiling a year, huh. um, maybe two, yeah. Yeah. some years, um, but not a lot of complaints about that. Um, and the complaints that we get primarily, primarily um, in the criminal justice system would be from people in corrections mm -hmm. who are complaining about um, things that generally are not within our jurisdiction, but it might be a religious issue or something that is, um, and then we would take those complaints from. Sheila, you had something that you've been waiting. Yeah, I just um, had a few questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so going back to the front face the case with regards to race, thank you, Jessica, for asking that. Um, I was wondering what you talked about challenges that you had before. I was wondering. Have there been specific challenges around proving a prima facie case with race with regards to the other protected categories that you've seen? 
I'm not sure I understand. So people come to you to make complaints on a variety of different protected categories. Mm -hmm. When um, people are complaining that they've been discriminated due to race rather than gender or something else, has um, proving a prima facie case been more difficult in, in a certain protected category than others, such as race? Or does it seem to, you mentioned challenges and barriers. I'm wondering if there are unique or specific, either personally what you're seeing from being in the work for a long time, or legally the policies or laws or rules that there are, are there specific barriers and challenges, and we'll just focus on race, because that's why we're here, that you're seeing that is a disparity maybe as a lack of better terms compared to the other protected categories? I would say not, because um, I think that last because of piece is difficult pretty much with most. That sometimes the disability cases are sometimes easier because people will outright say um, that they're doing X, Y, or Z because of the person's disability or it's an access issue. Um, and in, um, sometimes in the housing arena, people will make statements that um, violate the law around familial status and receipt of public, um, public benefits. But for the most part, in every other type of case, we're trying to suss that out from the general factual situation. And I think um, we have, through our own education, gotten sensitive enough about what happens to people of color as they go through various systems to pick up on those little clues that hmm, this just doesn't sound quite right. And in some ways, it's easier in race cases than it is in some of the other protected categories, I think. So with that, is there current things? Because I know from experience and working with your office and working with clients that often they have felt like the rising total of prima facie almost never reaches that. And if it does, it's these nuances of, well, they didn't directly call you the N-word. Mm -hmm. They didn't um, overtly um, be what we would call racist, I guess. But clearly, for the common person, my opinion, it's racist mm -hmm. and discriminatory and for most common people nowadays. But what's that law that is challenging that? I, just, I hear that, and that goes across where we're not just necessarily with race, but again, focusing on race. like. I consistently hear that bar not being able to reach for those nuances of not having overtly said or did something and wondering how that can be changed because you it's it's shocking to hear that there's one or two complaints and those even necessarily be internal where many of us around the table may know more than that or better than that. Mm -hmm. So there's either people not being coming for it for lack of calling. lots of reasons, right. not being able to access it for a lot of reasons, or feeling like the system is more troublesome for them mm -hmm. than it is good. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to go with the latter and, and, and wonder, there's so many steps. What is that that's happening with people? What do you think is happening with people who would or need to file racial discrimination complaints and feeling as though this isn't an avenue for them? What is been your experience? Um, I think to answer your first question first, which is the because of standard, right? So um, if there is anything there that we can kind of grab onto that seems like there's a difference in the way that this person was treated um, than somebody who's not in protected status, right? That's what we're looking for. And sometimes that's really hard to suss out. Um, because people don't make statements, but it's not quite like you have to hear the N-word in order to take a complaint. I mean, that's helpful, um, and I don't mean that, you know how I mean that. Um, but it's not, um, it's not necessary. It, it's looking at the overall circumstances and trying to suss out what was going on here. Was there a legitimate reason in a traffic stop? Was there really a legitimate reason to stop the person? Um, you know, if that, if that traffic stop seems sketchy because there's a million other people that follow too close behind somebody else all the time on the highway, but this is the person that got stopped, um, we might look at that because there's reason to believe that it could be based on their race, and then the investigation is to suss that out as best as you can. Um, I think, for me, that what I think are some of the barriers that are prohibiting people of color from calling about cases may be the time that it takes for us to investigate, um, so it's not instantaneous, you know, resolution. Um, I think it may be um, 
that as a person of color, you're experiencing microaggressions and issues all day long through your life. And so it takes something really egregious for people to finally say, that's enough, I'm calling the Human Rights Commission. And so I think we get that a lot, where somebody just has reached the end of their ropes and this one thing pushed them over the edge. Um, but I think um, a lot of people choose not to file complaints about the kind of everyday slights because you'd be filing complaints every day, all day long, right? So I think it's partially that, and I think there is a lack of trust in the community's color with the Human Rights Commission, and um, we need to understand better why that is so that we can try to address those, because um, I don't have a good sense of why that is and where the frustrations have occurred and how many of them may be related to something that was happening a long time ago in the agency that may not be happening the same way now or that's still happening the same way and that is problematic that we should know about so that we can fix it. The last, just, to, just oh. to, the last piece of that, you said about um, some cases never get made public or if they go to negotiation or mediation and things of that sort, and so they essentially get sealed. That be? No, so um, cases that where there's a no reasonable grounds finding get dismissed. All settlements that the HRC is part of, which is any settlement that doesn't go to a private mediation where they enter into a confidentiality agreement, all of those cases are public documents under the statute and they are filed away in our office um, and They're are accessible. Correct. They're online. Uh, They're on the web. The, yeah. um, the, the reasonable grounds decisions are on. Um, the settlements we put up there, but we don't usually put parties' names on them. Right. Um, so it'll just say um, individual versus um, state of Vermont. We usually put the agency there because it's the state government and people should know that. Um, but it's not individuals' names in the settlements, but people can call and ask, like, how many, what settlements do you have against DHR? And we can pull those up and provide them. So just so I understand to be clear, though, if you go to mediation, though, it is not public. It, it can be public if we're there and or the parties don't enter into a confidentiality agreement. We don't get a lot of confidentiality agreements because we like those cases to be public documents where the public can see what's going on. And are you allowed to let people publicly know how many actually go into a confidentiality agreement? And I say that because what I've seen, what I've experienced personally working with people is I've been through that mediation process and it happens to be people of color and then it's a secret and then nobody ever knows that that incident even took place. And I find that bothersome as we talk about data and we talk about numbers that then how does that actually get computed that there was this that happened, they actually were found to have done some wrong to it to want to go into mediation and make an agreement and yet don't want anybody to know about it, which raises another red flag and concern in, in my work. And it raises another red flag when we, as the people, are trying to discern and um, disseminate that information, that data, and just wondering, do you keep track of those ones that you're not allowed to disclose, but that is under we, the confidentiality clause? Um, we track the settlement information in every case in a database. So even if they do a confidential settlement, if we know that they paid out $40,000, it will say for that case damages of $40,000 and you know whatever other relief may have been granted. But well, we it's don't. in the protected category in which yes, if I do. yes, um, yeah. So all that's in the database. Um, we don't get that many confidential agreements because most of the cases are settled by my staff, and when they're settled by my staff, they're not confidential. So um, the confidentiality ones tend to be um, the employment cases where the complainant gets an attorney and they decide to go to formal mediation rather than using our informal process. And those cases can end up being confidential if the complainant agrees to it. And there's a lot of pressure to do that in mediation. There's no question about that. Major? You have? Um, I did, but it was from a while ago. I just was going back to um, something I think, Rebecca, you were pointing out about the concurrent um, nature. So we can, at, at State Police, we have a division set aside to investigate allegations of misconduct, and we can get a complaint or an allegation of any number of things, excessive force or uh, racial discrimination or any type of discrimination. And we will open that investigation, even if there is also a 
related car stop or related um, DUI arrest or something where that, and that's going on at the same time, but we'll conduct the investigation as, as best we can while those are going on at the same time. Yeah. And HR also investigates complaints of discrimination, and their investigations can be going on at the same time ours are. So they'll be investigating, we'll be investigating, we usually get their investigation, and then we can use that information in our investigation. So that's also one of the ways that we gather information. And sometimes we'll let them finish their HR investigation before we move forward. Yeah. Yeah. I want to just, okay, I just want to point out that it's two minutes to seven. That's all. Just, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Any, you have, have a question? Uh, do you have to file an end of year report with the legislator? Yes. And does that normally have uh, like a breakdown of all, like, you know, AOT had this many complaints against them? Does it have something like that? Or? It does not presently have that. But that's something, that's information you have. Yeah. And that just sits at the legislator? Does it just sort of go there? Um, yeah, it goes to the, um, the Speaker of the House and the Pro Tem of the Senate. And I think, it, I doubt they ever even look at it. Right. With you. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah. My question, you may have said something about this already. So thank you, Nancy, for repeating yourself. I'm asking you to repeat yourself. But it, something struck me in your responses to Sheila's questions, particularly for someone who is not a state employee and might not have clear guidelines for you know, what you do if you have a complaint, if you feel like you're being discriminated at work. Just the average Joe Schmo from Kokomo who feels like he got pulled over because he's black and had a Massachusetts license plate, how would he know to call you? Like, how would people find you? Um, I think sometimes they get in touch with various advocacy agencies around the state who will refer them to us. Um, but, um, you know, that's one of the issues is how much um, does the public know about what we're doing. And that's one of the things that we, I have been struggling with as an executive, di executive director because my job description is not doable by any one single human being, which is what I'm talking to the commissioners about right now. And um, to that extent, the things that slip off the radar tend to be the things that are going out and doing outreach to let people know who we are and where we are because, you know, I'm in litigation, I'm doing all this other stuff that I don't have time to do that. So. And I don't have any other staff. So that's just, you know, one of the realities of the situation. I would, if I can, I, I want to bring it back to somewhere that Chief Don was going and Sheila was going. That, and I, I guess as a question, you said six to eight cases about that are based on, that are, have to do with what's going on in the state in terms of discrimination. Employment discrimination. Okay. Not necessarily it's, public accommodations. There's more. But more. right. So I guess my what I'm thinking is how many. I'm sort of going back to the statute that we've got to come up with a complaint process, and I'm trying to figure out how many people do we need at the human rights commission. <laughs> Let's start there, sure. <laughs> but I just am feeling, it, it just feels like I'm just trying to get it to a point where we can start coming up with some practical suggestions since we're an advisory panel and we've got to write something right. that says we want this or we'd like this. We'd like say. this. But, um, um, so we have been having these ongoing discussions at the commission about the understaffing of our agency. So um, what, in my ideal world, in Ken's yes. ideal world, we would have um, a designated legal counsel who could do the litigation, who could do negotiation in closed cases, who could maybe do pre-conciliation, do conciliation even before that so that the investigator can just keep investigating and this person's trying to settle the case while they're moving forward um, and any other things the executive director needed. Um, and then to have like an outreach and training person who could go do that outreach and be the primary trainer 
mm -hmm. um, because right now all of that is on my plate right. in addition to doing everything else that I do. And it's just, it's not doable. So you're always... You haven't talked about the new laws. <laughs> right. yeah, and every, new yeah, and every year the legislature adds more work right. to the agency without any resources. And so um, it just, it's become clear to me that the agency is understaffed. Right. So can you give that in numbers? So you mentioned legal right. counsel, outreach, and training. Can you just give us numbers if you were in fully staffed the way you need to do, be to effectively run your organization? What would that look like? Number, People. additional staff. Yeah. Um, okay. I think, uh, so that would be the executive director, the staff assistant, three investigators, an outreach and education person, and a legal counsel. So it would be seven. That's what you would uh, need, or that's what you have? So you have have five. So yeah. just two more people yeah. you think could make, help get your job. Make a huge difference. Is that anything you've asked for? Um, so it started coming up in the legislature this year. Um, I talked to my person in appropriations. Um, I think they're open to the idea, but obviously getting provisions in state government right. is a nearly impossible thing to do. Um, so there's that barrier to start with. But this year, um, we sort of tried to plant the seeds um, with the various committees around the need um, because I didn't want to actually start pushing for more staff when they were trying to do this racial disparity panel because I was afraid that if I started pushing for more staff at the same time I was going to tank everything and so I just you know let that go through and then we are planning now to try to figure out how to approach the legislative session so any support y'all can give us we're working <laughs> well and again exploring the, the need versus the unfulfilled the demand yeah. what, what did you say the numbers of complaints are just total, legal, total without just breaking it down right. to employment. Um, so we take in, on average, um, 70 to 80 complaints a year. And how do you break them down? You said seven to eight of those are employment. employment. So um, the vast majority, around 20, are housing, and the rest are public accommodations. So, so I see. So that puts it at 28. So 80 minus 28. <laughs> 62. 62. 62. 62. And when you say public accommodations, how would you break that down for us in terms of our mandate, in terms of race? Um, so the primary, um, primary complaining categories in every area that we investigate is disability. Um, mm -hmm. Very high numbers compared to everything else. Um, and then I would say it's, um, I'll leave housing out because housing's got its own separate categories. but. And then it would be usually um, either sexual orientation or sex, age, race, um, probably in that. So now going down to that lowest number on race, do you have a sense of the numbers? The numbers are very small. Very small? Um, Roughly, I know yeah. we, we caught I, I should have brought my, I always have my annual report with me. I don't have it today. Um, you said, um, you said, right. you said you one, said one two. or two earlier. Yeah. Oh, one to two, one I'm sorry. Two. Yeah, that's just that's profiling. Two. Two. That's, just pro that's just profiling. Oh, that's just oh, profiling. Yeah, that's just okay. profiling. Okay. No. So um, in each of the areas, I would say we get two to three race complaints. So it's probably 10 or less. 10 or less, less a year. Yep. But, I think the big unknown uh, for me <clears throat> is how many, we're trying to find, like I said, an avenue to, to send people, but I think the big unknown for me is how many complaints stop at the department and never get to you. Like, say, if I had a problem with, uh, say, employment, the first place I would go to is probably the HR department, and where does it stop there? Or, like, like uh, what the major said uh, was that, they might call her saying, look, one of your officers profiled me. Uh, I want you to look into this. And they settle it. Or it never goes past the state police. You know, So yeah. I bet you there's a lot of departments that where this stuff either stops. And the only time that I would think in my own head if I was going to call the Human Rights Commission is if I can't get anywhere with HR or I can't get anywhere with the supervisor or the department, 
then more than likely I might try to head to a different avenue mm -hmm. that it's not going to cost me a lot of money potentially because if you go right out and hire legal counsel then obviously there's a lot of money so the first thing you would do is try to complain to a department that might look into right. it. Right, well so, so we don't charge anybody any money. No, 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 no. Clear, that's what I'm saying. They, is, they don't incur any costs. No, I understand. Right. But I'm saying that's why they would go to you first before right. maybe outside right. legal counsel because right. they want to see if they could get somewhere with you. I just, I don't know how we can gather the data from the different departments to actually see how many complaints they have Be, because we'd have to ask the departments to provide the complaints to get a true picture of, because if all of a sudden we say, okay, we're pushing everything to the Human Rights Commission right. and we're going to advertise that. Right. They may not even know the impact until a year yeah, later right. and all of a sudden they get hit with 300 thousand right. calls and they're like oh my <laughs> god right. so I, i'm just saying is how so do we get to the true that picture um, sorry Ten. so i think it's a good point and question and i think we should think about it because certainly it's certainly straightforward you can ask every department to an agency to respond to, to share the information and part of the human rights commission's role could be to actually gather that information also the question you have to pose is the one to think about is do you want to refer every case to the human rights commission i mean to a certain extent there are choices already and, and karen talked about several of them and should the departments we we do need to have our own internal complaint process i think that's actually important so the question would be and I don't know the answer, I'm just putting it out there, is should we give the, the complainant the choice? And if they do choose to resolve it through the department, should we go ahead and do that but share information so that we do have an accurate sense of how many complaints there are statewide? Yeah, I think the, so the analogy of the HR department I think might be helpful here in thinking of legislation because existing state law to deal with employment discrimination in the area of sexual harassment, for example. Uh, Vermont employers have to provide their employees with a sexual harassment policy which tells them where to complain within the organization, mm -hmm. but also if they're a state employee, it says you may bypass that system and go to the HRC if you're a state employee, okay. Good. or the EEOC in Boston, or if you're a private employer, you can go to the Attorney General's office. So employers have, so the employee, when they make the complaint, if you go to any lunchroom, you go to your lunchroom, you'll see the posters that tell you that. It's, that's also required by the state law. Uh, I don't know that there is a parallel requirement for any other complaints of discrimination outside uh, of harassment. So it's more about marketing the, the law more than creating new policies or new laws. It's about really making people aware where to go. Giving people informed choice. Maybe. I think um, that's right. I mean, that's part of why I asked my question, mm -hmm. because I think part of our task is going to be whatever we recommend, whether it's HRC or some HRC and some combination, like part of this is going to have to be how we educate people about where they can go if they... Anything else? Claudia, you I, I'm Claudia from the ACLU. Karen, what, I mean, your wish list is obviously uh, more you know, more investigators, more more staff. But in terms of this sort of information sharing, have you had a wish list in terms of what you wish you were getting from other agencies? What, you know, is there, like, have you thought over the years, like, this could be better coordination? You know, have you talked with other people about coordination? Has there been progress, you know, before the board? Like, you know, what, what would be helpful to you right now in terms of, coordination mm -hmm. um, I think that to the extent that the agencies that nonprofits whoever that are out there that know what we do um, simply to refer people that they think may be appropriate to us I mean that's another piece of to me that's another piece of the outreach is getting out there and really making those connections and the one of the reasons I think we get so many complaints from the disability community is they're really well organized mm -hmm. and there's a lot of agencies that yep. you know are know to send them to us and so they send them um, whereas that's not necessarily true with the other protected categories that we serve. Um, so I think it, it is the work that needs to be done as part of that outreach that is just um, difficult to accomplish at the moment. 
Yeah. I'm just looking at uh, 6A that says the task is how to institute a public complaint process to address perceived or implicit bias. As I listen to folks, maybe those systems are in place and it's more educating people as to how to access the, the process that's there as opposed to how to institute. And provide the resources yeah. sure. on the other end yeah. to sure. actually be able to investigate those cases. It just needs to be more people. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Mm -hmm. Sheila, who, did ahead. you say uh, who investigates the state again? We. You investigate this state. But yeah. who? Uh, okay. So the, just so you're clear, the reason that we're able to do that is because we have a layer of protection. So I don't, I'm not hired and fired by the governor. He can't touch me. Um, he has to go, so my commissioners are appointed by the governor, but they are the ones that hire and fire me. So that um, we're insulated from the wrath of the governor's office if we do things the governor doesn't like, which we often do. Thank you so much. Karen, have you absorbed the new law that passed? Creating, we talked about this at the last month's meeting and whether or not our panel needed to exist. Yeah. The mandate seemed to be similar. The new S1. Right. The new, what have yeah. you, in terms of how, you know, UCH, you know, commissioner's role, or the commission's role, in light of this new law? How is there overlap? in terms of what we're looking at, the yeah. complaint process. Um, so there's really, so the person in this new position, the executive director of the Racial Disparities Board, or whatever they're calling it, or the, it's not that, but anyway, the executive director, um, is charged with figuring out where there are issues of systemic racism within government writ large. So that includes not only employment practices, but also um, in the provision of services to folks. So there is a little bit of language in there that says that they are to act as a liaison with the Human Rights Commission. And then that, has, that was one of our major concerns as that legislation was moving forward was um, how are we going to be able to connect with that person so that they're not off, for example, looking at something in state government that we've already identified as a problem and they're going off this way on it and the Human Rights Commission is going off on this way on it and how we're going to have that and I think that's going to be a matter of building that relationship with that person and making sure that we all know like who does what and how to interact with each other appropriately but I think it's, it's an issue and it's been an issue. Should I ask the same question to you, Julio, in the Attorney General's office and the overlap with your office? I don't think so. I mean, as I understand the new law, they're really looking at, I think, disparate outcomes that might not actually violate a statute, but that might cause self-examination for the practices. I mean, the Human Rights Commission and the Civil Rights Unit, ultimately, when we do our investigations, we're putting together a case that's going to go in court, so people may have feelings about how they were treated, but um, the case, if you're going to get an enforcement where you can't get a settlement, you've got to put evidence on the table. And it's often, to, to Sheila's point, it's rarely direct evidence. It's almost always circumstantial evidence. And there's about 50 years of work in the area where people are very sophisticated at getting as much circumstantial evidence, whether that's comparison to other employees or statistical disparities, all that sort of thing. But I think this panel would really look at, might be looking at a broader picture and saying, looking at numbers and saying, we have these outcomes, this is really large, how are we generating these outcomes without having to prove in a given case that a prosecutor or a judge or a police officer or someone in our office made a biased decision are they aware of practices, and maybe the maybe bias is linked to other determinations like poverty um, or um, maybe age discrimination, so people of color at a certain age or, or maybe uh, maybe subject to different treatment without people really realizing it, and then making those choices, I think institutionally, um, and I think through training people, maybe changing their practices, and without ever having to say. 
in these five, 15, 20 cases, someone violated the law. Because that's, that's, that's very difficult to do. And, and so I think what makes the legislation at least promising, and I think these conversations are very promising, is you can say, okay, let's not drill down to the individual cases, but let's look at overall how are we doing mm -hmm. things. And you know, elsewhere in the country, people are doing these things without panels that are just generating changes. So I, have, I pay a lot of attention to the DA's office in Philadelphia and what Larry Krasner's doing. And he just puts out a memo and says, OK, we're no longer going to require bail on these cases, because what we're finding is that all the people who come in here are poor. And 90% of them are people of color. Um, so you, and sometimes they will, and they require the prosecutors to evaluate the cost of, the, of incarceration in deciding what cases to charge, et cetera. Not because they ever found particular violations, but it was just like, we're getting these outcomes. We're seeing the poor um, here every day, the dispossessed here every day, and so we're gonna change things. And I think that part of the work of the, that panel, and I think this uh, new, new uh, coordinator, I don't know what the position is, they keep changing Executive the name. Director. Executive director. Executive director, <laughs> fair enough. Um, I'm hopeful that they'll look at and try to take the secret sauce from places in the country where this is, where people are doing it right now, um, and just saying, rather than, I mean, the Human Rights Commission and, and our unit, I mean, we're enforcement agencies, right? So we're, we, we, we build cases and we take cases and we try to resolve and we try to educate and all of that. But this is, the idea of this panel and this next panel are a lot bigger than that. Um, and I think, yeah, I think it, where they will intersect is if we have an individual complaint where we're also looking at systemic relief, because that's part of our charge, right? That's the public interest that's been violated here, and how do we fix that public interest? So there's possibility of some intersectionality there that is not you know, could be problematic, but that's not going to be the majority of things. So when I talk about that panel, the way that I was, one of the examples I was looking at was that the health department has all this data around racial disparities and health outcomes, right? So that would be something this person would be diving into potentially is why are these racial disparities showing up in our healthcare system and what's driving them and is it really race or is it something else and is it poverty, is it something else and so how do we address those larger systemic issues is what that panel. And then I see this panel as focused really on the criminal and juvenile justice system which um, you know, there could be some overlap again but I don't think they're necessary, I think they could also be mutually exclusive on the level side. I mean, we can take disparate impact cases. So, I mean, it used to be a generation ago, police departments had height and weight requirements, right? And that just happened to knock women off all of the candidates' lists. And so those were lawsuits that were bought by enforcement agencies like ours. So the law does permit that. The challenge, though, in a race context is that the population is so low that you can't build up a statistical pool. You don't have enough complainants. So you might have someone where there's a standard and it, it applies and, it, and uh, the people of color who, who don't qualify or who, who get a, a bad result, but there's only two of them. And the statistical standard in court, might, you might have to have five times, 20 times as many to show a real statistical case. But if you're doing this voluntarily, you, if you just say, you know, we, we hear there are problems here and then we just look at it, we can self-examine and say, yeah, why are we doing it? Why do we have this standard? Why do you have to be six feet tall, be a police officer, etc.? Um, so I mean, that's part of the, po the the promise, I think, at least, is that it's a voluntary examination, and um, doesn't mean you have to give up whatever you're ultimately trying to get as a state agency. The question is just, can you go about it a different way that generates what you know what might be more equitable outcomes? I want to be a chair for a moment. And it is now 722, and I think we have to make some decisions about the rest of the agenda and whether we're going to table it and bring it up at another at the next meeting or whether we're going to continue with this because we do have to get in public commentary. Um, and we don't have a lot of time, frankly. So, um, I'm just bringing that up, not necessarily making the motion, 
but I am suggesting that someone may want to do that. I'll make a motion. Um, I'll make a motion to table um, discussing the, the producing racial disparity. Okay. I'm moving on to the rest of the agenda. Somebody seconding? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? All abstaining. Great. It'll be tabled. Thank you. I feel calmer now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just have one quick question. I think it's a yes or no question. Do you or any of the agency take complaints anonymously? Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. No, you said no. <laughs> yes. 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 Oh. yes. We do great. also. Yeah. Great. Just because so, people don't care where you say where you're from and to say yes, like so people understand. Yes. You say yes. Lisa Lenard, Department of Corrections. Okay. For the record. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, we at uh, Vermont State Police, we take complaints of misconduct from anonymous sources as well. The Vermont Attorney General's Office Civil Rights Unit will act on anonymous complaints. We just got enough evidence to proceed. Ken Schatz, Department for Children and Families. We also will accept anonymous complaints and take action accordingly. Thank you all. Thanks. Are we done with our people? We have a lot more work to do with this. Right, I was just going to ask what the thinking was about next steps. I think yeah. as, as, as um, Judge Gershon indicated, we obviously do have in the Human Rights Commission and the Attorney General's Office and even within different departments a system of sorts. Right. And I think the question is what do, and maybe that is for another time, and maybe that makes sense to absorb this conversation and at our next meeting maybe talk about a, a proposal about how we would respond specifically to this portion of the statute. I would suggest um, you're not going to like this. <laughs> that <laughs> we have, at least you warned him. Yeah, I warned him <laughs> that we get the minutes out fairly quickly about all of this. And then we can do, as Ken is suggesting, and sit and absorb what's gone on and then have another discussion at the next meeting that is more perhaps not substantive. That's not what I meant at all. God, I'm sorry. Um, more focused on actually constructing what the statute's asking us to do. That, so, well, would it be productive for all of us to have an opportunity to go around and do reflections or questions or comments to help us move into that for next time? So we just heard a lot from Karen. I'm just wondering, and there's a lot of questions asked. I'm just wondering if anybody had ideas, or maybe I'm just speaking to myself, or there's thoughts or whatever to what was said here today. I'm just wondering, and that will help us be like, oh wow, that's a great idea. We should talk about that the next time in our right. meeting. That kind of thing. That would work. We've got four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> great. I have, uh, I have a, I have a suggestion that, and it, it might be too early for this, but after hearing what was being said and a lot of emphasis being put on education and outreach, which I agree is needed, um, I was wondering. So in pullovers, and when police pull people over, you give them tickets, citations, or whatever, there's a thing on the back of the citation, correct, that says whatever it says. And I'm wondering if one of the things it can say is their rights and, and this resource. If we can actually end or the officers are fueled with those cards, literally, and it's not if they want it, it's when they're given a citation, these, this is the Human Rights Commission. If you feel like this interaction or whatever was not whatever, then you have the right to go to this entity and to file a complaint. And to really start putting that in a more formatted way. And I think that a citation, and I understand because I heard it, I think, a year ago when we first started this panel almost, about the money and citations and you just do them over or something happened. But it would be a great idea. And then to also have it on the police website, which maybe it's already there. I apologize. I'm not on the website every day. And, um, and have it a little bit more open to the public and in your agencies. So if I file a complaint with you, I don't know if it says, actually I think it does, but I don't know if it says, um, you can also file with the Human right. Rights Commission, which, yes. which I know yours does. But I'm wondering if other people's, I don't know, haven't been on yours lately. So there's just some Let's, ideas okay. that I wanted to bring into the space that maybe next time we could um, consider as ideas moving forward. Great. As a tool. Anybody else for two minutes? Oh. 
I just think, uh, I think what Sheila has said is really another piece of the, of the education. So yeah. I think that really the question we have to ask ourselves to get ready for the next meeting is, from what we've heard, are we comfortable with the complaint process exactly. that, that is in place, and can we then move into a, a real discussion of how we educate people to what's in place? I agree. Mm -hmm. And I think that conversation needs to be had in relationship to money and budget. I, yes. I think that I can't say yes unless the yeah. resources are there. We, I heard that we're setting people up to fail without utilizing those terms. And as a state and as state governments, I think I'm very disappointed in that as a state personally. Major, did you have? You were just moving your pen, no, sorry. Just, yeah. okay. <laughs> Pensively. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've done the way forward. Thank you. That didn't happen when I thought it would, but okay, we got it. Um, so we're going to need the minutes. <laughs> He's not going to like that. Um, Thank you, Karen Richards. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very, very much. Great. We, we, who knows? We, who knows we're going to come? You may be back. <laughs> um, I mean, once we start actually coming up with some concrete, whether it's to second what you're doing or coming up with. Um, I think the last time she was here, we put her on a committee. If I'm not <laughs> That's true. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> Can we um, move on then? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. So we want you to stay there. <laughs> oh, and you're welcome to stay. I mean. Yes, I'll stay. I'll just sit over. We want it. Um, there has been some question about the quality of the minutes and the accessibility of the, don't, don't, no. Pache, Pache James. Um, yeah, no, I, um, there, sorry, this really didn't come up very well. This, um, there's been some question about whether they are detailed enough to, adequately help us both come up with the, what the statute's asking us to and to inform the public about what it is we are doing. That is something that we need to, I just need to, we need to hear back from here about how that's felt in general, um, how other people feel about that, if that's a concern others have had. Um, whether we need to look at other ways of getting the notes taken, perhaps. Um, I'm putting that forward. Chief? I have a question. If this is going to be videotaped every time, and it's going to be on where people can watch it, that's a complete record of anybody who wanted to watch our entire meeting could really do it. That's the whole point. Uh, or if it's just live streaming, I'm not sure. So I'm saying is if, if you're going to do that, I'm then, not sure how much detail you need within the minutes. Because the, the, the minutes to me are, are more to keep us on the board mm -hmm. to, uh, to remind us what we're doing or talking about. Okay. And that's really the public recorded record. But I don't know if that's the case. I don't know if that's going to be recorded every meeting or not. I mean, what? we're hoping. Well, that's I'm just the asking the That's the intention. Where are where is this person from? What are yeah. you? This is your <laughs> right. uh, I'm more media, so you can be found on channel 17 and on our website. Okay. Yep. Uh, and about how long after you video us here today will it be up on your I'll site? Tomorrow. Tomorrow evening. Oh, okay. So this is a full video of the whole meeting. It's not live streaming. It's a whole a video of the of our meeting. Um, and I know Sheila and I think, um, committed to 
trying to get this organized last time, so I just want to thank you and anyone else who was involved in making it happen. Um, but and so, the, I mean, is it going to be possible for it to be recorded every? We meet once a month. Yes, okay. yes. It is set up to be recorded every month. And the question on the table is whether we mm -hmm. could, could afford, well, streaming, because that came into the conversation. I don't want to divert the minutes conversation. But the streaming part is going to cost, it costs money it for costs streaming. Money. And we don't have a budget. Right, right. And so um, I think streaming is a good way to have public participatory um, conversations. I think it's a great way for people to like thumbs up, thumbs down, to question things. I think it's a great um, way to have many people on many different places access something so important. So I would like the um, committee to think about potentially investing in streaming, and um, ORCA does provide that, but that part is for a fee. And if, if there's appealing for that, I will go hand on me wearing sackcloth Seared with ashes and beg for money. I promise. So, so you'd like us to tell you whether or not we think it needs to Yeah, I would like stream. some discussion about that. Well, are we going to finish the minute thing and then move sure. to that? Or sure. we do, I mean, whatever, I don't care. Is it all one? In a sense, it's all one because there's got to be a budget for both. I agree with. Chief, that to me, if there is going to be an additional what, media format by which the public can view the entire meeting, then to me, the minutes are really just for us to refresh our recollections each month. And I have found what I've received, um, certainly this last time, to be sufficiently detailed. That is my I agree. With you. you agree? Yeah. Yep. Um, I agree too. But I also would, there are probably a conference line within state government, maybe even the AG's office, that if you didn't want to go to the expense of streaming and you just wanted to have a conference line where people could call into and we call in there too and everybody can listen to it, but keep them on mute, you know, so that way if. Uh, at the end, with public comments there, then you could then open the channel to allow people to talk. That might be a free version. I don't know, but most most corporations or companies have conference lines where everybody can dial into and have a big old conversation. Then I, I got in the interest. Thank you, Sheila. You and I should do some more work. Okay, aren't we happy? <laughs> <laughs> so. I, get, I won't even put it to a vote. We'll just go off and we'll do some more work on this and see about other ways of, um, of, make, of, that, of making this accessible. Can I just so, and can I, oh, can I make two suggestions on that? And I'm like a total Luddite, so I'm not the right person to speak on this. But I happen to participate in an ACLU webinar, so they might be a resource to right. ask sort of how they do it. And then I think there's Facebook Live, right? Like, yes. Or something like that. So. Right. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ken? I was just curious how much the live streaming costs. Yeah. I mean, and I don't, maybe you don't know that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's 75. That's what we were finding. 75. Okay. And I would just say that to your point that yes, um, with having videoing and then having the minutes not necessarily be as detailed as they as um, maybe some of us would like, but also just thinking of different modalities of accessibility for people. Um, not everybody has a computer or a TV to be able to watch this, and I just want us to be mindful as we're talking with people with different abilities and different resources and access. That again, I'm looking from a perspective of many different people and how they might access this information. Um, which le so, actually leads me to a really good question. When these videos become available, are they close cap? Is there close captioning? I don't know. I'm not involved in that element. Okay. Um, and then who owns the video? Could we post them on the committee's website? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, and the minutes will go up there too. <laughs> <laughs> no, obviously. <laughs> Anonymously. <laughs> All right. Moving on, then, maybe. Scheduling of next meeting. If it is the second Tuesday of next month, that is the 14th of August. 
Does that conflict with any holiday I don't know about? <laughs> Aid, perhaps, or? <laughs> I don't know, Ramadan's over, so. I think that'll be a big one. Does it go over here? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> He's that, only the chair. That, he doesn't know where to yeah, yeah, I know. I'm the chair. I don't know. Um, no, I, that's some. David does the scheduling of the rooms. So I'm not sure where it will be. Sorry. Um, but yeah, no, I'll send something out ASAP. I promise. But it will be from 6 to 8 p.m. on that day. Everybody okay with that? All, yeah. all okay? Say aye. 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 All not okay with it? All having an odd abstention. <laughs> you don't have to call in. I'll be awake. Okay. Um, you'll call in? Or, or we'll figure Or I might not. Okay. <laughs> well, oh, no, no, no. You're on vacation, <laughs> Sheila. <laughs> no, no. Now. I'm to hang up on you. Let's yeah. stop. Let's stop. Um, public. Public, hello, our guests. Yes. And we yeah. have Hi, um, Ann Schroeder yeah, from um, Wyndham County. Stand up so you can hear me. I'm from Wyndham County People Power, ACLU. Um, and um, a bunch of stuff was answered during the meeting, but I still have a few questions and comments. I'll try to make this as quick as possible. Um, one thing about the Human Rights Commission website. Um, and sorry, Karen, can you just get me back there? I didn't want to interrupt. I, last the other meeting, I interrupted. Um, so um, I noticed that, and you mentioned in the November minutes um, that public accommodations was most of state government, and including things like roads. But there's nothing on the website that says that. Um, so how? would people know what public accommodations? I mean, if they went to the website to look at, to click on the different forms, how would they know what public accommodations is? I mean, some of it would be obvious, but I would never have thought of roads as being a public accommodation. So I don't know if I could go on the website or if this is just more about the whole thing, which people talked already about, the whole idea of publicizing all of this stuff. Um, the other thing, I didn't see anything there on that particular page. I didn't go through the whole website about um, the, what the protected status categories are, whether that might be helpful to be right there on that page, um, just so people could see whether they were in one of the categories and whether that would be helpful. Anyway, um, oh, oh, I was thinking a lot about um, that this whole thing needs to be publicized more, but that's one of the things you guys are going to do. Um, something else I wondered about, I thought just, this is just something I'm going to mention. Um, that Act 54 says that recommendations um, in, in number six says, um, and you guys are looking at 6A now, but mm -hmm. number six, um, it says recommendations to address systemic implicit bias. But then in 6A, um, it becomes so what you're talking about here, the public complaint process to address perceived implicit bias. <laughs> And I mean, I, I you know, and I, I guess since the act says this, you really you have to address the perceived part. But I really think the systemic implicit bias is a better phrase. And I don't know if this goes anywhere. I'm just throwing that out there. Um, something else um, that this new racial equity advisory panel um, has, uh, of course, they, as we talked about, they have a broader charge. Um, and whereas you folks are focusing more on the criminal justice system. Um, but because you have this public complaint process, um, I look through S5 and it's really more of an internal approach. Um, you know, they have, um, you know, they're gonna review racism in the, in the, the, the three branches, they're gonna do data collection, they're gonna create a new policy, they're gonna do training. Um, but it's much more internal. There doesn't seem to be anywhere about input from citizens about race, and any kind of racism or any other discrimination. And to me, this makes the charge of your panel even more important because you're going to have a public, a way for the public to reach you and let you know what's going on. So I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. Um, 
And let's see if any of these other things. Oh, this one maybe is too much, but I'm trying to get a handle on implicit bias versus explicit bias. Um, and is explicit bias um, a criminal act? No, not necessarily. Um, well, some things can be paid crime. Like, is that what you're? Yeah, yeah, I'm just I mean, trying to get a handle on what the two things. Some crimes can be enhanced yeah. to hate crimes based yeah. on explicit. But it, implicit it would always be civil crimes. You no. know, if I could take a stab at it. Oh, yeah, so, sure. I think it might be, I mean, we could spend a whole week. Yeah, well, that's why I wasn't sure what you would do. But I, I think the simplest approach would be usually explicit bias is where someone is consciously acting on. So I am going to treat you differently because I treat because I think you're you don't deserve the same treatment as someone else. Whereas implicit bias really tries to uh, approach that we may be acting and not really thinking about thinking. Oh, I don't like those people and we treat them that way. We might just have assumptions that we all carry with us um, views about people of color and crime, the associations of crime, for example. Like it's you know that's kind of pervasive. Um, so I think that's the idea, and part of this group and, and the, the other panel is, I think, to kind of force self-examination of people to seriously question why they do what they do and whether there are biases that are motivating it without that, it being on the top of their head. I think that's the idea. Um, when you're talking about enforcement, if you're taking someone to court, you're generally, I mean, in a lot of cases, you have to prove the explicit bias. You have to mm -hmm. show that. Um, that's, but to change your culture in an organization, you don't have to get to that point. You can just ask people to, uh, you know, examine how they do things and, and to kind of throw those biases out on the table and be honest about them. So I think that's yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Others? No? I have a suggestion. Um, Can you guys do find out your location for next month? Yes. Any possible up on your website? Yes. Last month was yes. possible. Yes. There were, yeah, no. Lot, um, there were a lot of problems. Sorry. I know this. <laughs> Did everyone in the room get to sign the sheet? Yes. OK, thank you. Um, Hold on. That was that. New business. I think we. I'm gonna. The only thing I'm gonna put out there is brainstorming. That will be the buzzword for August. Brainstorming, given the conversation we had with Karen Richards, I think it it, it was it was wonderfully theoretical and open, and I think what we now need to do is go back to, in a sense, what we started with, which is, what do we do with 6A? And both Sheila and Judge Pearson have made, you know, there have been some really good proposals. Perhaps the Human Rights Commission is fine. Perhaps they just need to be staffed better. I'm saying perhaps, not saying definitely. But this is the sort of thing that we need to be really thinking about and bring to the table in August for a really wide-ranging discussion where it is not, I would say, completely unthinkable that we would start taking some notes for some document. And I think that that would be a good idea, in fact. Um, and a document that I think we should approach it perhaps the way anthropologists do. Um, this is something I know something about being one. Um, you write something and you take it back to the people that actually helped you write it and you go, what do you think? And they go, you really don't get us. <laughs> and let's go through this again. And you go back and forth and that happens about, oh, let's see. Let's, I have done it about 12 times in fact. And finally you've got something that everybody can sort of live with and everyone's disappointed and then you know you've done it. <laughs> and um, so we may start putting some notes down that will help us all be disappointed in the end. All right? 
one quick question on that. So what, well, no, it would be a quick question. Like, when you were focusing on 6A through C, right? That's what we're focusing on. Are you planning on submitting something as we complete, like A, and doing something with it? Or are we waiting, we're going to shelve that, and then at the end do one big document? I mean, what, what's the plan? I don't think we've had that conversation okay. as a group yet. Oh, well, I was just curious. Because I, once you finish A, then what do you do with it? Do you, you know, so I guess we'll. I don't know. We'll come to that when we come to <laughs> we'll, we'll, right. we'll have that conversation, but okay. not tonight. OK. No, that's fine. Anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? Because I think we're kind of done. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. All opposed? See y'all.